Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Mary, for such a kind welcome. Good morning. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here with us. It's such a pleasure to be here today speaking all about AI, which happens to be my life. Um, so I won't talk as much about the company itself. Sanjivini, one of our core team members, who is a UPenn alumni, is right here. Would love to talk to you and tell you more about the company. But today I'm going to talk more and more about what this breakthrough moment in AI really means. Where are we coming from and where are we going to? And I'm titling this from pattern recognition, from pattern recognition to cognition, what AI means for the society. Um, so as I said, the story of AI is very much intertwined with my personal life story. Um, so it's been a lot of roller coaster rise for me to be where I am today. And it has everything to do with the fact that AI ended up being the topic of conversation everywhere, but something that I was personally obsessed with since I was a kid. Um, so I started in AI now 19 years ago. I have to keep track of the years and update my bio. Um, so I started in AI 19 years ago uh, from robotics. Um, so this is um, basically the World Cup of robotics called Robocop competitions. and. Um, you know, we used to compete in, and this tr truly used to be the state of the art in the field of robotics with all these uh, tumbling robots. And at the time, I thought I was actually working at one of the toughest problems within the AI space, which is to build this multi-agent systems that can actually plan and can uh, basically have all these actuators that they can control and play a sophisticated game, such as a game of soccer or uh, rescue a world that is a disaster. But fast forward, I came across this phenomena called Moravec's paradox, which basically entails that whatever is hard for us as human beings is actually the easiest for machines, and whatever is easy for us as human beings is actually the hardest for them, which basically says that a problem such as common sense reasoning which is the most basic cognitive ability of a three, four-year-old child, is the hardest thing to imbue in machines. So common sense reasoning was touted as the holy grail of AI, and hence I obsessively applied myself, applied my whole life towards solving a problem as simple as this. So let's read it together. The monkey ate the banana because it was hungry. Who can tell me what does the pronoun it refer to in this sentence? The monkey. Everyone knows, right? Not just you guys. Even if you had like a t three, four-year-old child here, they would know. But believe it or not, this was, as at the time, 19 years ago, the toughest problem in AI that would be really unsolvable by any state-of-the-art systems. So fast forward, I worked on the same exact class of problems for a decade. And believe it or not, fast forward 2016, the problem was still unsolved. So at the time, Stanford Core NLP being the particular state of the art system that people would use for this core reference resolution problem, which is basically the umbrella term for that classical example, it would fail. It would think that it actually, uh, you know, basically refers to the banana. Fast forward, you would think that the first generations of the GPT models that nowadays is the, the, the talk everywhere uh, would solve it, but nope. At the time, as you can see, robot, field of robotics made all sorts of strides forward with these crazy Boston Dynamics um, videos uh, being introduced to us. But it's still, GPT-2 model before, you know, chat GPT um, th thought that it refers to the banana. And fast forward last year, 2023 was synonymous with AI, with the introduction of ChatGPT, of course, in late 2022, but mainly 2023. And it was like doing all sorts of crazy things. It was the sensation. It was all about the fact that finally, maybe we are getting to so-called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And you would think that was solving it, but nope. The same exact stupid, easy classic example um, that I got uh, introduced to 19 years ago was still unsolved by um, ChatGPT in 2023. 
So it thinks that the um, banana is actually the core reference here. So I'm making this point to say that these amazing AI models that we have that are supposedly passing the bar exam, for instance, make seemingly random mistakes, which means, well, they've come a very long way, but we have long ways to go. So fast forward, uh, GPT-4 finally can actually solve that one problem, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it can solve other instances of that, you know, categorical, that part uh, of basically common sense reasoning. Um, I love that moment that finally this <laughs> classical example got solved so much so that this year, this was my Halloween costume, so I went as that classical <laughs> problem. And when people would greet me, I would ask them what does it refer to. So I'm finally free. I do not have to talk about this um, common sense reasoning problem. Um, but point being that um, we've come really a long way in imbuing machines with common sense. This is a mural at our offices in, in New York um, where, I don't know if you can see, <laughs> this is their bunch of luminaries bragging about their achievements in AI, mathematics, and computer science. And then the robot says, sorry, I'm not sure I can understand. Can you please repeat that? So three years ago when we started the company, that was truly the state of the art in AI. But because we were insiders to the field, we knew that this breakthrough moment in AI is coming because finally we had gotten so much closer in imbuing machines with common sense. So point being that our bots are not that stupid anymore. So we've made a lot of progress, but we have really long, long ways to go. And if I have to sum it up, believe it or not, we don't yet even have a system that has common sense reasoning capabilities of a dog, let alone a human. So we have long ways to go to f basically build an AI engine that does all sorts of sophisticated things, ranging from dynamic world modeling to planning to actually intentionally going about operating tasks and getting to a level of similarity to even how a dog would have uh, both emotional intelligence as well as all sorts of other cognitive abilities. So uh, if I want to sum it up, I believe that in this whole journey towards getting towards the peak of AI, which will be to build machines that can truly match human intelligence, we are we finally made the strides and maybe we are getting close to the foothills, but we have long ways to go to get to the actual peak of these mountains. Um, so I know the audience here is um, you know, roughly technical, uh, but what I've seen, interestingly, is that a lot of back history of AI is getting lost in the um, uh, academia as well as in the industry. So people think that they woke up one day, this breakthrough moment in AI happened overnight, and that makes business folks very much anxious. That makes so many other stakeholders very baffled in terms of what they should do. So I thought very, very quickly, if we go through a crash course <laughs> on where did it all begin and where are we going from this? So as I'm hoping everyone in this room is familiar with the face of Alan Turing, uh, actually the reason we have that Wall of Fame mural in our company is that my co-founder and I, Omid, we, uh, watched the imitation game many years ago. This would be what, like eight, nine years ago? I don't remember when the movie came out. And we were so amazed and baffled by the fact that Alan Turing had to live that life that we knew that his face should be on top if we ever have a company. So Alan Turing is basically the, the godfather of our field of artificial intelligence. And believe it or not, Neural networks also started back in 50s, so the first version of uh, neural nets being a perceptron was introduced uh, way back. Um, and then fast forward in the 60s, so one more decade almost, uh, we had boom times in AI. So AI was uh, the topic of conversation again, and um, Marvin Minsky, another AI luminary, actually famously said, in three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. And it's 2024 now. So uh, as you can imagine, because of that uh, over excitement um, and under delivery, we had our first AI winter, which means the money dried up. And I'm putting these 
uh, little figures about the, the sizes of the, basically the, the, um, uh, the semiconductors as well for you to get a sense of how much that entire line of research itself has helped us get where we are. So that was thriving on its own, but on the AI side, we had our first AI venture. Then uh, fast forward, in 80s, we had uh, the boom times this time around with symbolic AI. So symbolic AI, which I think a lot of people don't even know what it stood for anymore, um, was another way forward for AI systems to work. So a lot of investments was, investment was introduced again. And uh, this is what a uh, GoFi recipe for AI was. Who here knows what GoFi stands for? Not even one person. This is fascinating. Good old fashioned AI. That's what I'm saying. Like I grew up <laughs> learning about all the history of AI and it's not being taught anymore. And it, well, because it shouldn't, this, this field died out, but you should know. So good old fashioned, good old fashioned AI basically referred to the way that symbolic systems were working. And how was it? It was saying that basically you can code away everything as a script. So let's say you want to do language understanding uh, for this, like a question comes in, uh, you would know that uh, the input phrase, for example, should match a certain pattern. So let's say take call, if it is uh, basically that you want to accept it or join, you will have a certain flowchart that you would follow and you call it a day. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, they would put logical reasoning systems on top of it so that you can actually make deductions and uh, very kind of controllable uh, paths forward. Uh, but that caused the second AI venture very much because uh, turns out there are infinite ways that you can speak <laughs> to mean the same exact thing or you know, the other way around. So the problem of natural language understanding is actually much, much, much harder than wanting to script it through a, like a flowchart system, if you will. Um, so money again dried up, again, overexcitement for symbolic AI under delivery. So we hit the second AI venture. And fast forward, 2012-ish, um, which was the big data slash deep learning boom. Um, so all the resources poured in, we are like talking about data science today, all these data science institutes started actually um, like getting money and funding to exist very much due to the fact that deep learning was finally working, which was all about uh, basically uh, large amounts of data that could be finally crunched through the fact that we had better compute power. And meanwhile, people working obsessively towards deep learning were making better and larger models, which had everything to do with why things were working. And um, fast forward, now we are in generative AI boom. And I'm putting generative AI in quotations because my god, I hate that terminology. And overnight, now as if everything didn't exist, it's a marketing term that people are slabbing on top of anything, any stupid product, any stupid whatever, like a, it could be a curriculum, it could be a, like a new title. What I would say is that I think the term generative is not going to be around for the next like few years after that. Like try not to get your job title or your institute title. Uh, associated with that. I know some universities who shall be named, uh, na you know, remain nameless ha have done that. Um, but gen generative is actually a misnomer. It should, if technically speaking, it should be uh, called generation, not generative, if in the kind of scientifically speaking. But anyways, again, we have the same thing that a lot of money is pouring in and a lot of resources are be being spent on AI because finally things are actually, actually of working, and if you look at the uh, progress basically made uh, in terms of the, the size of the models, it is truly an exponential growth, which again has everything to do with both data and compute power. And so we are able to do all sorts of crazy things that I personally would not have ever predicted would be the case at the, uh, you know this year. Um, we can generate images and, and you know, again, as mentioned, um, these uh, AI systems can pass the bar exams or we can do protein folding, which is truly revolutionary for drug discovery. And we can do all sorts of really, really cool things. Um, but if I want to basically point out to where we are, 
I keep going back to Gartner's hype cycle, which basically talks about how with any technology trigger, there's always, always an inflated expectations period that then will be met with uh, this disillusionment phase and hopefully finally getting us to where the reality is, which is where the productivity truly hits. I think that unfortunately we are not there yet. Like I don't think that the disillusionment has happened quite. Um, uh, and so we have a, like probably a few more like years-ish to go for the society as a whole to realize that look, it's been a, more than a year now since ChatGPT was introduced. And we are, a lot of us are still doing the same things that we were. And it is because it's not this magic wand that you can cast and all sorts of automations happen. And also the technology is not there, that's the reality. Um, so to now bring it all back to what does this really mean for all sorts of stakeholders in the society, ranging from businesses uh, to you know, consumers, um, I thought that it would be good if we look at it through the uh, basically uh, threats versus opportunities. So there is a lot of talk about AI being an existential um, basically uh, threat to the entire humanity. Um, which I tremendously disagree with. I think all the talk about how AI is going to take over us and is going to overnight as if get sentient is a distraction from the real threats that we have to worry about today, which one is rapid job displacement. Uh, this is happening as we speak. The truth is AI is a productivity tool is capable of doing all sorts of tiny, tiny automations, which you know would be the livelihood of, of many, many people that are doing that as their day-to-day -day job. And the reality about AI uh, as a new technology shift is that it is actually much, much more rapid in terms of its scaling, uh, which wasn't necessarily the case with the prior such events in history. So that's something that governments should worry about, that uh, businesses should worry about, the entire society should worry about. And the second problem I would say, a real threat, is misinformation and disinformation. In this country, we have our uh, you know, next election coming up soon. The truth is we have a lot of you know, sounding intelligent AI systems that can generate text, that can generate videos, that can generate all sorts of images that will be fake. And we never had an election cycle that was dealing with this state of the technology. And what are we doing about that? That should be the topic of conversation, not AI getting sentient. And uh, we are not gonna talk today about uh, regulation and all of that, but that is also another distraction I would say, um, which as you know, one of my favorite economists, uh, George Stigler, said, uh, it is often that regulations are a way for the industry to get ahead, and it's a way for the big guys to put moats together for themselves uh, to prevent uh, basically innovation from smaller companies. Um, so the opportunity, in my opinion, is that this is truly bigger than the PC revolution. And Steve Jobs famously called the advent of uh, PC to the basically new man-machine partnership that will um, change everything. And if I had to um, call this um, moment anything, I would say this is the moment of true augmented intelligence and a moment of true um, man-machine partnership that we've ever come across. And um, I genuinely, if I had to redefine AI, I won't call it artificial intelligence, I would call it augmented intelligence because that's really what we are doing here. So AI can have so many truly fundamental use cases as that man-machine partnership entails uh, for saving us, literally saving us, for like doing uh, basically drug discovery, for um, helping us with the climate uh, uh, basically challenges, to help us with agriculture, so many fundamental use cases that will take, in my opinion, decades to get to a point that we can see the true fruits of it. And meanwhile, we have to put up with the stupid like gimmicky things, which are fun, for example, like a, you know, a Johnny's version of Taylor Swift Black Space. 
So finally, to um, kind of get to, uh, uh, to wrap it up, um, three years ago, I co-founded Veronique with my um, co-founder, Omid, uh, to very much so bring the power of augmented intelligence to everyone. So our mission is to build the most helpful AI that can augment every single one of us sitting here and anywhere else in whatever capacity as a person or as a business so that we can all make better and faster decisions. Um, we believe actually that the best path forward for uh, bringing helpful AI to the masses is to go domain specific. So very much unlike the mainstream, we believe that AIs that are helpful have deep domain expertise and they're not the average of the World Wide Web. So very much not an LLM being um, the business model, but very much so about uh, language models and beyond that know exactly where they're grounded, know exactly the consumer, know exactly the business, and are there to answer specifically questions and engage in very uh, basically fundamentally relevant uh, topics to that particular grounding. So domain general intelligence, one domain at a time, is what we do. We are all about uh, bringing uh, these AI instances right where you are, again, as a business owner or as a consumer, for example, um, our shopping AI um, uh, instance would be able to answer all your questions while you're shopping. For example, you could be landing at a at the pharmacy uh, and uh, or you can be basically shopping online, um, asking what is your highest rated golf iron set that can be delivered next week uh, with the particular specification. So you just talk it out loud and it understands that domain, it understands you, and it can execute on that uh, basically a request immediately. Um, in the world of finance, you can ask, how can I save $100 next month, say, on your favorite banking app? And it would know exactly what, who you are. It would know uh, what, uh, basically, uh, your budget looks like, and it will help you make that decision. And, um, for example, in healthcare, a doctor, a clinician can, say, send an email to all my patients who have diabetes and are on a recent re recalled medicine. So it would know what is that recalled medicine in that particular time frame and would know the patients of that doctor and will really help that clinician uh, make better and faster decisions and literally save lives. Um, so we are all about bringing this to businesses so that they can put it in front of their consumers. Um, so each business will get to have their own deep domain expert AI. And since we are talking about data science, as you can imagine, we believe that the way to get a lot of data intelligence is by deploying these AI systems that can gather that data very firsthand by virtue of reading into the brains, literally, of your consumers and of your employees and of your associates, whoever it is. And that data becomes, of course, insights. Um, so fast forward, like what we have right now in terms of very, very practical applications of AI is through our commerce platform, which basically changes how consumer retailers and consumer brands and media companies operate. We hand delivered this AI engine that they get to deploy across business functions. This is an example. You can find below the list for sugar. So as you saw, that person was able to find exactly where they wanted to go by virtue of asking it out loud, something super complicated. This is uh, Mutterly, uh, just an expert content website where moms can get advice. So on that channel, you can literally talk out loud, um, ask how can I tell if my baby is underweight and AI completely understands it and generates an answer for you. Uh, or on your you know, favorite uh, e-com like fashion website, you can ask, do you have any yellow bag with black strap, uh, straps? And then it finds exactly that item, which is really, really different uh, from how we used to do search and discovery. So I showed you all those examples to talk about, uh, to tell you basically 
how practical the real use cases are. This has nothing to do with sentience. This has nothing to do with AI taking over. It's just about really like moving away from the technologies that belong to 90s for search and discovery to put a conversational interface on top of it all and make it so that everyone can really save time, be more productive, and uh, be happier. Um, so to bring it all together, I talked about this journey of myself intertwined with the journey of AI. And um, this is definitely the most exciting time of my life because AI is finally working, uh, but we are still at the foothills. We have long, long ways to go to get to a point that I can say that we could match the human capabilities in terms of cognition and even pattern recognition. So I wanna leave you all with one uh, point to just bring it all together. That as human beings, we are all about our perspectives. We are all about how we see the world and how we perceive the world. So um, turns out, as uh, I learned as a scientist many years ago, as human beings, we don't just uh, passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. So we have priors in terms of what a scenario should look like, and we just you know, start generating and projecting into future, which is why like hallucination is a thing, which is why it's so easy for us to get tricked into even filling in the gaps in our memory and beyond. So with that, um, if I tell you guys, show you guys this word, what does everyone feel like? Pain, right? So just like this meme goes, it's like a sad, painful, scenario, whereas you can imagine it's a continuation to pan au chocolat, right? So life is all about perspective, and I personally am a testament that your success is truly based on your internal autoregressive language <laughs> model, if you will. So try to be the one that generates the most positive outcome for yourself. Thanks. <laughs>